Good morning, good morning, good morning. How are you? I'll zoom into my camera in a bit. I've got one and 1.4. I'm gonna try 1.4 today, so it's experimental. But I don't think it's an optical zoom, so it's a digital zoom, but then it might, uh, uh, I know, take two seconds less. When I'm cropping my picture, I'm placing it on the top right hand corner. I hope you're well. My last day of work, I'm going to um, Africa for a couple of weeks to uh, hook up with a friend of mine who, uh, you might have heard me mention him, John. He spends the uh, winter out in uh, Gambia, so, and he kept saying to me, go, you gotta go, you gotta go. It's, you know, it's good fun. It's, we can chill out, etc. have a beer. And, um, see, so yeah, I've immediately mucked up my cropping, haven't I? So I didn't go for a long time, and then I went once. I had quite a good time, and then, then uh, now, now I'm sort of going every year, so, it's not a massively expensive holiday. It's about 1,500 quid for two weeks. And that includes the flights. It's in the same time zone. It's 30 degrees out there now. So, uh, and everything's pretty cheap. So, you know, especially for you know, UK dentists. So we go out there, we play a lot of chess, basically. Uh, do a bit of drinking. Eat where we like, different place every day. Mostly chicken and chips. And uh, a lot of walking on the beach, you know, getting fit. I lost about half a stone, I think, last time I came back. So, a couple of things I wanted to cover today, only because they're topical. I'll try and upload this before I go away. One is the uh, industrial uh, strategy, you know, uh, industrial relations, so so called. Uh, just to, to, to refocus, and uh, some of this you, you will have heard me say before, but I'm going to try and get it really get cut down and in focus, so that what you can do is you can sort of uh, incorporate into your model of um, how things work, decide whether you agree with me or not. Um, broadly speaking, we're going through a, you know Finder regime of Western civilization. Now that's the that's the broad brush approach. <laughs> We've got um, governments uh, adopting the Keynesian approach of printing money whenever they want to or feel that they need to or, or eventually whenever they'd like to, just printing money. Money, they don't have to redeem their money for anything that's in, in short or finite supply. So um, basically they can print as much money as they like. And so they, you know, they've got this sort of laissez-faire approach which means that um, they think that uh, printing money is the path to prosperity, you know, if they can just print money. But of course they ignore the uh, Austrian slash uh, Chicago school of thought, which is that you can't print, just print money and give it away uh, because that devalues the money. The money will eventually buy less with a lag of about 18 months as, as described by Milton Friedman. So at the top, if you like, I'll try and print a little diagram of this. At the top of the uh, of the funnel, you've got money printing, government money printing and government money spending. And that is the inflation. That is that is what I call inflation. Inflation of the money supply is what that is. And that causes consumer price inflation down the road, which I'll get to, but don't get that confused. Uh, when people talk about inflation, you have to be very careful about whether they're talking about money supply inflation or an, just an increase in consumer prices, which they call it inflation. But it's not, it's, it's an increase. If you inflate a balloon, don't you? you don't increase a balloon. You, prices increase and balloons and money supplies inflate. Uh, by, mean, by, by which I mean not only that more money is being created, but that the amount of money in total is, is going up. So, let me just put the blowers on for a second. Now, you've got things that, um, so what's happening is that money supply inflation is creating consumer price inflation. And that's putting pressure on uh, uh, wages because people you know, find that they can't afford the stuff that they're used to buying. And uh, it comes through in this order. You get uh, house price inflation. Uh, you then get commodities uh, price inflation. So things like timber, copper, uh, 
just stuff, corn, uh, oil, etc. And then you get um, consumer price inflation, and then lastly you get wage inflation, and that and that trickles through in that in that order pretty much. So on the um, side of everything that makes inflation caused by the increase in the money supply worse. So on the on the minus side of the balance sheet, if you like, is um, what I will call supply side shocks. So anything that um, interrupts the supply of goods and services makes inflation worse because the goods and services become more scarce. And so you have to pay more for them in your, in your debased and your devalued currency. And a couple of the most obvious ones are um, uh, Ukraine, uh, putting the price of oil up and uh, if only temporarily and then um, Covid uh, which basically shut down pretty much all manufacturing and, and service sectors in the UK and so those are on the negative side of the balance sheet there now sometimes people say oh well this is Putin's inflation or this is inflation was caused by Covid and um, that's not accurate it's accurate to say that those factors make the inflation worse but you have to remain um, you have to stay on target and, and understand that the inflation is mainly caused by government increasing the money supply printing money and spending it on whatever furlough payments you name it uh, most you know the entitlement society um, government wage bills public sector employees etc which I'll come to later now on the on the the plus side of the uh, you know the factors that could help you uh, if you're suffering from uh, uh, overprintitis is uh, demand side shocks so you've got supply and demand and the price for everything is a, is a competition it's a wrestling match isn't it between supply and demand so I've described two supply side shocks so let's think about demand side shocks well, uh, demand side shocks might be something like um, uh, people being poorer, people not having so much money, people not being able to buy stuff. And when people can't buy stuff, then the price of stuff goes down because, uh, you know, if you're selling something, nobody's buying it, you reduce the price, don't you? It's a straightforward relationship between supply and demand, reduce the price and the demand goes up. And, um, and and at the end of the day, the uh, the, the other thing is that um, wage inflation helps because if people have got more money, then they can buy more stuff. So, broadly speaking, you've got this overall problem, which is being made better or worse by by two factors on either side. Now. Then at the end of the day, uh, what comes out the bottom of the funnel? Well, the bottom of the funnel is the actual purchasing power of the of the currency unit, in our case, the Great British Pound. So uh, what is going to happen is eventually pounds will buy less. And I've said in the past that, you know, I think people are a bit dumb when they say, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm so wealthy. My house has doubled in price. Whereas uh, my, my house has doubled in value, whereas in fact it hasn't. It, it's still got the same value, it's just doubled in price. Um, because the, the value of the pounds that are being accepted in exchange are um, have, have fallen in you know by half and eventually what happens is your currency unit becomes less valuable and so as a result uh, you know you have to pay more and more pounds to buy a, a euro or pounds to buy a dollar or whatever so we're looking very closely at exchange rates now the um, exchange rates in countries which are doing this would be even worse uh, if they weren't all doing it. Or rather, uh, yeah, so, so for example, I mean, the, the major offenders are, are all the major banks. So you've got the Bank of Japan, Bank of America, Bank of England, European Central Bank. They are all doing exactly the same thing because it's like... Um, <coughs> They're all uh, like to print money and they've all uh, agreed really mutually that now is a good, or the last five years was a good opportunity and a good excuse to print money and they've all sort of mutually agreed to do it. And in the same way as, you know, 
a bunch of people eating, dining on the Titanic on the uh, fifth deck down <clears throat> start to see the water rising and so they all agree to move the dinner up to the fourth deck where there's no water. And, um, and so obviously everything then carries on as normal. Well, things don't ever carry on always as normal and you know, the, the whole, it depends how far you want to look, but I mean the, the UK, America, certainly Japan, um, ECB, uh, the world even, is on a, is in a debt spiral where uh, they are going to have trouble financing repayments on existing debt, let alone taking on any new debt. And, and without printing money and taking on new debt, they're going to have trouble financing the expensive foreign wars and their re-election campaigns. So that's the sort of the backdrop, okay? Mon monetary uh, expansion at the top, supply side shocks, demand side shocks, and with depreciation in your purchasing power of your currency unit coming out the bottom. But at the moment we're all in free fall. So we're all like a bunch of parachutists that have jumped out of a plane and we're all floating around in the same in the same airspace, all saying, well, this is fine, you know, I'm not I'm not going down, you're you're just going up, or I'm going up, you're going down, and eventually we're all gonna hit the ground, so and that's when market forces will dictate that uh, you have what they call a sovereign debt crisis, which basically means that the country's bankrupt. And uh, we've had them before. Uh, lots of countries have had them. Uh, all government currencies end in sovereign debt crisis. You could argue over the over the long period. Uh, you, you go crying to the IMF, don't you, to uh, uh, try and sort you out. I don't think they'll be able to sort things out this time, though. Um, so, what I mean, who does lose? Who are the losers? Well, the losers are the um, uh, there, there are two ways of sorting out inflation. One is to uh, put interest rates up above inflation, where uh, so so it gets to the point where you know you make more money saving than you do spending. Um, or the other way round is where you have interest rates are below inflation, where uh, you you make more money spending than you do saving. And at the moment, we've got inflation is well above interest rates and so um, everybody's still it pays everybody to spend rather than save because um, if you spend uh, you'll you'll get an asset which may depreciate but not as much as if you just kept the money but the government can't increase uh, interest rates above inflation because it for, for technical reasons which i won't go into now it would mean that they would have to pay more interest on their debt and uh, they've got so much debt that they literally can't afford even another one or two percent on top um, of, of their uh, debt. So that option of increasing interest rates above inflation is not on the table. And so inflation is going to get a, you know run out of control for a few more years yet. And that's why everybody's on strike uh, because everybody is is trying to buy uh, things that increase consumer prices with money that's buying less. So they need more of it. So, you know, so, so you've got this situation where everyone's on strike. So now why are dentists not on strike? Well, we're not on strike because for the most part we're in the private sector and it's the public sector that's uh, uh, gone on strike. And the public sector is paid out of the public finances and it's the public finances that have got this massive squeeze on. And they are the people that are going to lose out of the money printing. Um, you could say that's you know ironic because they're the people who probably benefited the most from the money printing. I'm sure a lot of the money printing went into the public sector. Um, but the, the whole thing, when the uh, government doesn't raise interest rates above inflation, then uh, 
and make the cost of borrowing prohibitive, uh, then what happens is people carry on borrowing until they've got no more, you know, the, the, the credit suppliers and the money supply and the credit suppliers has expanded as far as it can. And then what happens is people have to do less. They have to live in smaller houses. They have to um, eat less well. They have to buy uh, minced meat instead of steak. And they have to eat in cheaper restaurants and go on less expensive holidays. And that is where the value comes from. The value comes, it's really just sucked out of the middle class. The, the um, uh, dependency culture, they tend to uh, always be poor and just about live on a subsistence level anyway. The rich don't really get affected because they're, you know, for them, cost of a meal out is, is neither here nor there. And uh, so the people who are just, you know, the wage slaves who go to work every day and still got a mortgage to pay and stuff like that, they, they just take a massive hit to their standard of living. <coughs> and so that helps on the right hand side of the demand supply, that's a demand shock. And so as a result, um, uh, consumer price inflation comes down and uh, and the government sort of got away with printing money and spending it and really it's all been recouped through inflation tax. So fortunately as dentists, certainly in the public, in the private sector, we're able to um, adjust our fees to, and that's why dentists aren't on strike, you know, we are in a very fortunate position in many ways in that we are in a profession which is unlikely to be replaced anytime soon by either robots or AI. We are unlikely, you know, we are a good credit risk historically because we're registered with the General Dental Council. We can't just hand the keys into the practice and, and hide from our debt. You know, we tend to be findable <laughs> if we renege on our with high professional standards, you know, you can't commit a fraud, uh, fraud on insurance, fraud on uh, banks or anything without losing your job. And nobody really wants to do that. So we're sort of, uh, we've got high ethical standards. And we're in a job that is, um, has, um, you know, people are always getting toothache and therefore, even when the were in the worst case scenario, where nobody's got any money, and nobody's going to the cinema, and nobody's going to the restaurants and anything, there'll always be someone with severe toothache who has got no choice but to get a loan off his dad or credit card or something and and get and get the problem sorted out and then unfortunately there's enough of that work thanks to the government's ineptitude and mismanagement of the dental service over uh, the last 40 years there is still more than enough of that work or at least to stop us you know when if things get really bad so we're, we're very robust and as i say and we can set our own fees so we are able to pass on increases in uh, cost, you know. Now it's sort of 20 pounds for six grams of a Moxel. Uh, you know, it's, I'm having to readjust. My technician always says to me, you know, he says, when he, when he, I start complaining about how much he's charging, start at 50 pounds of a repair and stuff like that. And he said, oh, he says, it's just my luck to be working for a dentist who was sort of still in, still in the 1980s <laughs> in terms of fees. <laughs> anyway, uh, the um, nurses have, uh, and doctors have said they're not going to go to the review body this year. Normally this is evidence uh, giving season for, for uh, awards that are due to report in the 1st of April. And uh, uh, for the first time, they've literally said, "No, we're not going to. We're not going to bother because the whole thing's a fix." And uh, anyway, it's too late. Next year's award would be too late for the problem that we've got right now. Anyway, 
Um, and it's not going to solve today's strike, you know, some sort of award in April. And they're, they're echoing something that I've said for a long time, which the review, review body system is fixed. It's fixed. It's uh, designed, it's a quango, it's designed to isolate the government from the unpopular decisions that they'd like to make, but which they convinced the review body to make for them. The whole thing about evidence giving is a charade. It's all decided on the, uh, the terrace at the House of Lords or the House of Commons dining room. And if the review body should ever, uh, bearing in mind their members are all appointed by the government, should they ever come up with a, an award which the government really substantially disagrees with, then <clears throat> the government can always reduce the award even if the review body has says, states explicitly that they've already reduced the award because of economic circumstances <coughs> and affordability, the government just re reduces it again. So if the uh, review body said that we're going to give dentists 10%, but because the economy is in the right state, we're going to reduce it to five, the government just says, well, you've recommended five, but because the economy is in the right state, we're going to reduce it to two. And also, they've used up their goodwill. You know, they, you know, there's only so many years that you can keep saying to the profession, well, you know, it's jam, you're going to have jam tomorrow, jam tomorrow. And we've got to the end of the jam tomorrow now. What with all the pot hanging, uh, banging, and pot, pot and pan banging, and, uh, you know, the NHS angels, they vaccinated us all and everything. And now, when it comes to paying them, we're not, you know, we're going to go back to cheese pairing. And uh, there we go. So yeah, I always go back to the Trevor Holdsworth uh, Doctors and Dentists Review Body, where he he recommended, he made recommendations that the government basically sort of took the attitude that he'd ignored them. And, and, and had seen no merit in their arguments and they got aggrieved at that and so they just dismissed the whole lot and got in next year, got in a, a bunch of other people <laughs> that'd be more amenable to, you know, going along with the gag. Literally and metaphorically. So, I, you know, I think it's amazing. I think it's good. And I hope it's the end of the review body um, system. I think um, we always said that there was a system which was much better, and it's called pendulum arbitration. And it's a much better system. What happens is that both sides put in um, an offer, and the either side is... Um, what, what happens is the arbitrator looks at both sides and then he's then free to impose either one offer or the other um, but but not vary them so basically you either get what you want or the you get everything you want or the other side gets everything they want and let's say that both sides are a long way apart then uh, they're both invited to withdraw their offers and put in new offers that might be a bit more reasonable. Which they will do because having had your first offer rejected, there's absolutely no point putting it in again. You have to put in something that's a bit closer to the uh, opponent's offer. All the time knowing that if you judge it correctly, you are going to get your offer accepted and, and, and therefore you are going to get everything you want and the other side is going to get your deal. And not their deal and so what the incentive is to try and um, try and get close to the center but but still remain on your side of the center in terms of uh, uh, terms of conditions etc and then there's a good chance then that not, not only is that quicker but it, it means that both sides are more reasonable um, because they will they know that if they're like stupid in their offer, then their offer will always get rejected and the other sides might get accepted. Whereas if they are um, sort of quite moderate in their demands, but still, still, you know, 
would be, you know, it encourages people to put in the offer, the minimum offer that they would be happy with. And that's an excellent system which could, you know, unions don't have to um, negotiate directly with uh, government like they used to in the old smoke filled room days. You can do it through some sort of arbitration, some some independent third party, but that would be a much better system than the um, the craniest Quango review bodies that we've got at the moment. So, so I'm pleased the nurses have, have made a stand. Right, I'll um, I'm on holiday now, so I might not talk to you for a while, but I'll talk to you soon. Bye.